Hi, fun seekers. Welcome to another edition of the Christ is All podcast. Today I am on the line with my friend Adrian Warnock, who is an author and a blogger, and he is sitting in his living room in England while I'm here in sunny Florida, and we are right now talking on the internet. What we're going to be doing is discussing social media from the perspective of the Christian We're going to be talking about blogging. We're going to be talking about getting your message out to the world. And so, Adrian, um, roll this ball. Well, thanks for having me, Frank. And uh, this is going to be a bit interesting because I guess we're both sort of used to being uh, in the driving seat a bit, you know, being interviewed. But we're going to sort of try and interview each other a bit and just have a bit of a discussion together about um, all of this stuff. And I think, you know, maybe a good place to start is, you know, this whole social media stuff blogging, internet, Facebook, Twitter, even Pinterest, Instagram, Tumblr, the whole lot. You know, some people would just say, look, isn't it all a bit self-promotional? Isn't it all a bit self-aggrandizing? Why, why would a Christian be involved in any of all this stuff? Or should we all just be sitting around in a, in a room flagellating ourselves? <laughs> I don't really know where this concept of self-promotion and self-aggrandizement, whatever that word is and how you say it. I, I have uh, no com- idea. I just said it wrong. <laughs> I probably said it wrong. Sounded right to me. Of course, you British really know how to pronounce words correctly. But anyway, I don't get that because what I see, at least when I log on to my computer and I, I see something on Facebook or Twitter, is I see individuals spreading a message, sharing information, giving updates, whether it's about their personal life or it's about something that, if it's in a Christian context, God showed them or maybe something they read that blessed them. You know, Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he was on this earth, he had a message to give and he used various different means to give it, you know, whether it was on a mountaintop and he spoke to multitudes or he was sitting in someone's home and he shared it. And then, of course, we have the writers of the gospel who put that message into pen. Paul of Tarsus did the same thing in the marketplace, in the hall of Tyrannus in Ephesus. There were locations and places wherein the message that they carried was shared. We live in the 21st century. We have something called the internet, the web, whatever you want to call it. This is just another avenue by which we can share what God has shown us, if we're Christians, or whatever message we have, or whatever we feel will help and enrich others. Now, if somebody is totally focused on themselves and saying things like, let me tell you about me and what I do and what I have done. Well, I can see that self-promotion, but I don't know anybody who does that. At least I'm I'm not following them on Twitter. (laughs) Yeah, you blocked them a while ago, probably, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, so I'm not really sure where that comes from. And, you know, if anybody is on Facebook or Twitter or they have a blog, they are saying something that they believe is of value. And to make that into self-promotion, I don't really get that. Yeah, no, I think that's right. But it it can come across sometimes like self-promotion, I think, especially uh, one of the things that I feel passionately about, and I think I know you do as well, is that I think it's very important that as God gives you a bit of a platform, a bit of an audience, is that you actually serve that audience well. and, And you don't just think, uh, I've got all the answers and I, I need to just use my audience to hear my views only. And I, you know, I think you do see some people a bit like that where, you know, sometimes they've even got a very big Twitter following or a very big Facebook following or a large blog. And you never see anything on there that isn't something that they produced, you know, the latest quote that they've thought of or the latest sermon that they produced. And, and to me, I think sometimes it's really nice when people, and I know you're great at doing this, will actually you know, link to something else and say, hey, you know what, um, that guy over there, he's just done something really useful. You want to see that debate that he's recorded or, you know, I was just listening to this sermon that this preacher preached Mm -hmm. and I really like it. And I think that I'd like to see Christians doing a bit more of that because I think that's certainly one way to make sure it's not just all about me, but about the message. Because if someone else is getting the message out better than you can on a particular subject, I think it's really good to draw attention to that. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And there you're talking about, I think you're talking about this idea of promoting other people's work and not just your own work. And I think that that is definitely something that 
will separate those who tend to be more insular and feel that their work is more important than others versus those who are more interested in the message. And so if they're interested mainly in the message, then they will be happy to promote the work of others in order to buttress or spread that message. So right there, I totally agree with you. And there are people who every time they tweet something or every time they put something on Facebook, it is only what they have produced. And you know, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but I do think that it is indicative of kind of an insular look at things. Yeah. I think it's much better to embrace and to engage and to promote other people who are doing something similar. And this gets back to teamwork. It gets back to the corporate nature of the body of Christ. It gets yeah. back to helping each other. I mean, you and I found one another through social media. Yeah. I've never heard of you before and probably vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. But then we begin to see that a lot of things that we say are on the same wavelength and you say things a lot better than I do. So I'm happy to say to the people who follow me on Twitter or Facebook, hey, this is what Adrian has produced. Check it out, whether it be a book or a blog post, etc. And I think yeah. there's something healthy about that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think one of the things that sometimes stops people is this bizarre thing that some people have, which is that if I link to something, that that means that I'm endorsing everything that that person has ever said. And sometimes it goes even further than that. You know, you're endorsing everything that that person has ever endorsed as well. So, you know, uh, you know, person A, I think you've talked about this yourself, you know, person A has said something that is fantastic. And you say, I really love that thing that person has said. You know, I don't know about you, but I sometimes get, you know, pushback that says, but don't you realize, you know, person A also said this, and that's terrible. How would you call mm. a heretic? And I'm like, well, I'm not quite, <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not sure they are a heretic necessarily. I mean, that's the first thing. But even if you're right and they are a heretic, I'm not quoting the heresy. I'm quoting this good thing that they just said. And, um, you know, and certainly then, of course, you get the other people who say, ah, yes, but, you know, person A, they hang out with person B and C. And, you know, if you, if you are quoting person A, then you're surely endorsing person B, C, D, E, and F, you know, and, and this is terrible. And I think that, this idea of separation, which of course is a fundamental thing for fundamentalists, isn't it? I mean, many people would argue that's the main thing that differentiates a fundamentalist from a conservative evangelical is this idea of separating, keeping yourself separate, I think can cause us a problem. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of things that you and I wouldn't necessarily completely see eye to eye on, um, but they're going to be subtle things and they're going to be things that are not primary core things. And I don't have a problem with that, you know? To me, you're describing the ugly dark side of the Christian world, and unfortunately it's highlighted in social media, and that is this idea that if someone quotes another person, whether they be a Christian or not a Christian, that that somehow means that you, as you said, endorse them and agree with everything they said. And that is just a sophomoric, ludicrous idea. If we use that standard to judge a person, then we would have to condemn Paul of Tarsus. Exactly. Because in the New Testament, he quoted Cretans, he quoted Epicureans, he quoted Stoics, and these were not friendly people to the gospel, okay? Yeah. Uh, especially the Stoics and the Epicureans, because he quoted them in a I'm positive sorry, I'm context. Sorry, I've, just to, I've just got to say, it's Stoics. It's Stoics, definitely. The, I'm just kidding. Carry on. The Brit rebukes the American, and I receive your correction. I stand corrected, folks. But, but, yeah. but you get what I'm saying, and I don't know any person who levels that charge against others who isn't guilty of it themselves, somewhere in their life. Maybe they sang a song by an unbeliever or a line from a song. Well, right there, does that then mean that you agree with whoever it is? Yeah. In their lifestyle, in their viewpoints, it's just ridiculous. It's absurd. Yeah. And the only people I see doing this are people who really are going after someone and they want to misrepresent them intentionally. I had an individual who basically said that I believe in X, Y, Z because a Anglican priest, listen to this, Adrian, an Anglican priest endorsed one of my books. It was actually yeah. Jesus Manifesto, which is an orthodox presentation of the divinity and humanity of yeah. the Lord Jesus Christ, perfectly in line with the creeds, etc. A Christ exalting book. Well, there was an Anglican priest who endorsed that book. And someone <laughs> who 
basically said, well, you know, Viola believes in liberal theology because this Anglican priest endorsed his book. Now, just think about the logic of that. Yeah. I didn't endorse that Anglican priest. He endorsed my book. So that makes me yeah. complicit in what this Anglican priest believes. I mean, it's just silly. Again, this is the dark side. I've written about this subject before. These are blog posts that have gone viral because it echoes so much of what God's people feel today. Uh, but one of them is called How to Be a Jerk Online. Yeah, I and, like that well, I appreciate that. And Rick Warren, bless his heart, with his 1 million plus Twitter followers, he liked it enough to uh, retweet it and share it. And that was really surprising, but an encouragement because I think God's people need to look at how they're reacting to things, what they're saying on social media, because this is a megaphone that everybody reads. And unfortunately, the world is watching how we treat one another as Christians. And regrettably and tragically, it's a joke to many people because all they see, often what they see is God's people attacking one another in some of the most ruthless ways. No, I think that's right. Uh, And actually, one of my most popular tweets um, just said this, unity of the spirit does not require agreement on every doctrine. Mm. And disagreement on doctrine is not an excuse for hate. Uh, if yeah, I was editing that, I'd change that to it's never an excuse for hate, actually. Mm. Because I think, mm. I think that's the problem. And there's too much hate around. And, and I think that does come out on, on Facebook and on Twitter. Definitely it does. Um, and there's also, you know, this idea, and a more subtle form of that idea, though, is the idea of, well, I see all the hate, I see all the dodgy doctrine, I see all the, you know, the false teaching. And let's face it, there is a lot of, you know, unhelpful mm-hmm. teaching out there on the internet and, and, and in other medium. Uh, and I think some people withdraw because of that. And they're like, well, I'm not going to be involved then. I'm not going to enter the fray. Uh, and I, I, this, there's something actually that John Piper uh, blogs about about that. And I, I think that's really good. He, he wrote about how, look, you know, there's two approaches to the internet. One is to basically say, look, it's a mess. You know, it's ruining our kids. It's, it's destroying our concentration levels. It's full of pornography. Let's have nothing to do with it. And the other which says, um, no, let's try and fill this thing with as much Christ-exalting you know, material that as, as we possibly can. And, and I think that's helpful to do that. And I think that's what we need to do, really. Um, and it's so important that we do that. And it's so important that those of us that are trying to do it support each other instead of, you know, shooting each other down uh, and encourage one another and, and link to one another and, and, you know, share our audiences a bit and say, hey, look, you know, there's this guy over here. You know, he might not go to the same type of church as you. He might even disagree with you on some issues. But guess what? He's got some really useful things to say and, and, and go listen to him. Go, go learn from him. Go benefit from him. I, you know, I think one of my passions is that we, we've got to recognize that Christ is at work in his body, in all parts of his body. And, you know, we can learn things from each other. And, you know, you may grasp something much better than I do. You know, someone else, you know, I might think, well, they're totally wrong on this subject, but I may feel that I can benefit from listening to them on that subject, you know? Well, absolutely. And, and what we're talking about here, too, is, you know, when we use the word doctrine, there are peripheral doctrinal differences. Somebody's an amillennialist, somebody's a premillennialist, somebody's a panmillennialist. Yeah. There are different views on what does election and free will actually mean and how do they interact with each other. But then there are genuine doctrinal differences that would be classified as touching orthodoxy. Someone who says Jesus of Nazareth was not divine. Okay, well, that's a biggie. And it doesn't mean we hate the person, but we can say, well, they're clearly misinformed. And if they're promoting and evangelizing that, well, then they're evangelizing a false doctrine. But that's very different from disagreeing on so many of the peripheral things that Christians disagree with and draw swords against one another over these things that are not tangential to the orthodoxy of the faith. When it comes to the internet, I agree with Piper. It's like a knife. You can use a knife to kill someone or you can use it to cut tomatoes. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, fact of the matter is, some days I do hate it just because of the poison that some quote unquote Christians are spewing against brethren that number one, they don't know personally. Yes. Number two, they've never taken the time to go to, to talk to if they have a concern or an issue or a question. Something that Jesus and Paul hammered away at us again and again, that if you have an issue with your brother, you go to them. Uh, For example, there's a lot of poison against John Piper. I've never met John Piper before. From what I've read of him, I respect him. He seems like an authentic, genuine 
Christian leader, loves the Lord, has helped a lot of people. Mm. But if someone who doesn't know the man and doesn't know much about his ministry personally finds some of this venom, many Christians tilt toward believing whatever they read. And if I saw something about Piper that someone posted on Facebook or Twitter or, or on a blog, and I had a concern about him, then I would do my best to go to that brother yeah. and talk to him and say, look, I read this, is this true? And you know what, Adrian, that is so basic. That's Matthew seven twelve. treat others the way you want them to treat you. And how often do God's people, or at least professing Christians, violate that? Yeah. You know, who would want someone else, if they were being attacked or misrepresented or spoken evil against, yeah. who would want anybody to believe that without going to them and yeah, asking, right. hey, I read this, what's up with this? And so there's so much of that, that it really makes the Christian faith look really jokey and yeah. to unbelievers because they watch this, Christians emaciating and excoriating one another in the name of Christ, in the name of sound doctrine, in the name of whatever. We have not so learned Jesus Christ to act that way. If I have an issue with you, Adrian, I'm going to do my dead level best to go to you directly. And with the internet, we can do that. Most of us are accessible. And I think even John Piper can be reached if somebody yeah. really tries. Sometimes, you know, if you're trying to address an issue rather than a personality, you know, to discuss a doctrine rather than uh, attack someone, I think there are occasions where you can go ahead and and just write it. But you should even then be willing to to retract or to change or you know what I'm trying to say that let's say you write something um, well meaning and, and not with bad venom. But then you discover that you got it wrong. You know, it's an act of humility to then go back to that post. And again, you know, with the internet, you can easily do that and say, hey, you know, I've, I've realized that actually, I, I read this and I, I interpreted it this way. But it turns out that, you know, I've taken this a bit out of context um, and I've found this other quote or someone's pointed me here. Um, you know, and I've certainly done that, you know, where um, sometimes, you know, because the reality is I, I think not everybody is as contactable as you, Frank, uh, let's be honest. And uh, so, and, and, and I think as well, you know, if you're talking about issues uh, as opposed to personalities, that's, that's the way I see it anyway. If, if I see something oh, that I disagree with absolutely. doctrinally, I'm not going to necessarily you know, send an email at that point. Um, but I think if there's a, a major, I mean, to be honest, I keep out of most of the kind of controversies around, you know, personalities and behavior and things. You know, he said that, she said this, and, you know, sometimes there's all kinds of things that goes on. I try and keep away from all of that, to be honest. Well, and that's one of the reasons why I respect you so much, because you are building up the body, you're not tearing down. And in the few cases, the few cases where I have written a critique on someone's writings, and I don't do that often, I will be sure to send that critique yeah. to the author to make sure, number one, am I representing you correctly? Yeah, very good. Or am I misunderstanding you? And number two, have I said anything here that could be taken as a personal yeah. criticism? Because yeah. I, I don't want to personally criticize anyone. You know, to criticize someone's writing or a, an idea they have is one thing, but to do the ad hominem thing and attack them, well, that's a totally different ball game, and that's something that Scripture condemns. Yeah. So consequently, I will be sure before I hit that publish button, I'm going to send it to that author. I'm going to give them ample time to respond. If they don't respond, well, then I'll go ahead and publish it. And even then, I'm open to hear from that author or their readers to point out where I've missed it. And that's a standard I've raised in my life, and I think that that's in, in line with Matthew seven twelve, which the Law and the Prophets hang on that. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Sure. Any yeah. author would want that. And I don't see that happening as much as it should, Adrian. No, that's right. And I think there's an adjustment, an adaption to be made as well, because I think people, people are used to sort of, uh, you know, their leaders being closeted away a little bit. Um, and I think, right. you know, especially if you're a busy guy, um, I was talking with uh, someone just recently who, you know, well, Matt Chandler, you know, he's got 12,000 people in his church. Um, and plus he's the president of a, you know, whole group of churches, you know, he's busy serving Jesus in all kinds of ways offline. Um, that for him, maybe he doesn't have as much time uh, to be online as, as someone like you or I. Um, but, 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 you know, maybe, I mean, I don't want to get into specifics of him, but what I'm trying to say is that I think because people perceive people to be uh, distant, they don't realize that actually they, they're not 
always quite as distant. And as you say, there exactly. at least are people who are around them who are not distant. And actually, um, when you do put something online, I think you've got a duty to then look at what the response is. And I think for me, as I look back over, well, over 10 years now of blogging, one of the best things for me has been when I've written something um, and then I've got feedback and I've realized, my goodness, someone's misunderstood this. Uh, and, I, I, and you have a choice at that moment to, to either think, well, they've willfully misunderstood it uh, or to think, well, maybe I should have expressed it a bit differently. And, and one of the things I've tried to do is, is to learn how to speak in a way that people who are not in my tribe understand. And I, I think a lot of people don't do that. You know, you see a lot of content online and people will use words in a certain way or they explain things in a certain way that just doesn't make any sense unless you're within the in-group. So, you know, I wrote some spectrum posts, some theological spectrum posts. And each time I did that, I wrote it. So one of them was on the Arminian Calvinist issue. You know, mm. one of them was on the role of women. One of them was on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all that. And each time I did it, I, I tried to outline a number of different views because I think it's not always as easy as A or B, black or white. You know, different shades of grey, if you like, that I felt diff I'd seen different people having. Try to give them labels, try to define them, try to explain them just so that people could understand where different people are coming from. But one of the things I did when I posted it was I said, look, if I've got this wrong, please let me know. You know, if you hold one of these viewpoints and I've not expressed it properly or I've, you know, um, denigrated you in some way or you feel that I've not treated you fairly, please let me know. And, and each time I did it, I got quite a bit of feedback people sending me emails or people writing on their blogs saying, oh, Warnock, he's terrible. But what I tried to do each time was then go back and revise it, edit it, hone it. Mm. So I think those posts are now quite helpful. And still, even though they've been out there for a while, you know, if anyone sees anything on those posts and they think, well, no, he hasn't described my position properly, um, I'm, I'm very happy to consider going back and editing them. And I think that kind of thing is one of the nice things about the internet is that, you know, if you write a book, it's out there and it's quite hard to change it. Write a blog post, you can edit it next week if mm, you need to. Yeah if you have the humility enough to <laughs> to change your tune. And, and that's one of the things I love about you, Adrian, is, you know, not only is there a genuine humility that you carry and that can be detected, but you are one of the few people in sort of the camp that you are often associated with that reaches across the aisle and is open enough to receive from your brothers and sisters who may not come from your camp. And I regard you, and I would throw Steve Brown, who is a Reformed Seminary professor, into this um, same category. You guys are models of someone who can be very strong in your theological persuasion, your theological heritage, but not so strong that you become a Pharisee. The Pharisees were separatists. We talk okay. about separation. They were separatists to the nth degree, and they were the fiercest enemies of Jesus Christ wow. because of their separatist attitudes. And you're a model to say, yes, I belong to this heritage, I belong to this theological tradition, but God doesn't live in a box. And the, the great men and women who live before us, who gave us this great theological heritage, they didn't have the corner on all truth. And so I'm going to, if I see Jesus Christ in the Westlands, if I see Jesus Christ over here in this camp, if I see Jesus Christ over here in that camp, He's bigger than my theological tradition. I'm going to receive the Christ that they have, and I'm going to embrace arms with them, even though we might have minor disagreements on various theological points, but they have Christ, and Christ is fuller than my own little camp. I think you're a model in that, and I just want to say that publicly, and I wish that all the leaders who are part of your theological tradition and heritage would hear this and would take it to heart, because I believe that this is what the Holy Spirit wants. We'll never come, as the body of Christ, we'll never come to the fullness of Christ if we stay within our own little restricted camp and become an echo chamber where all we're doing is repeating the same guys, whether they're dead or living, because they're part of our little enclave. We'll never touch the fullness of Christ. So I just want to applaud you in doing that and being a model for so many others. And, and may your tribe increase, my friend. May your tribe oh, increase. Wow. Well, I don't quite know what to say after that, Frank. That's, um, you know, but I, I think perhaps for me, one of the things that may drive the way I um, try and approach things online is that, you know, I, I'm not sure that I fit as, as closely in, in a particular camp as, as you think. And for me growing up, I mean, it's, it's kind of changed a bit recently, but for me growing up, I, I was within a group of churches in the UK um, that right from the, well, really from the late 70s and the early 80s would have 
self-consciously seen themselves as both reformed and charismatic. But what that meant in practice was that everybody hated us. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, as a kid, I think a lot of people, even Christians, would have thought of us as a cult. Um, mm. And so, you know, I remember when I was baptized as a, as a fairly young child, actually, but, you know, I, I, pers I badgered my parents into eventually letting me be baptized and, um, and, and you know, because I, I responded in faith to Jesus and all that. Um, but, but, but my own extended family, none of them would come. And the reason they wouldn't come was because, you know, my, my parents had come from a, a sort of solid brethren background, actually, um, oh. and they'd got involved in these charismatics. And, and because of that, you know, they wouldn't come. Now, over, over the years, I think a lot of those barriers have broken down. But there was so much in the 70s, in the 80s, uh, there was so much antagonism, and even the 60s, I think, between the charismatics and the non-charismatics that uh, in the UK, especially, I think that happened in the US as well, that, you know, people literally hated each other. But of course, you know, we, we would be, unlike some of our fellow charismatics at the time, we did not want to sort of jettison the Bible. I mean, I remember a very well-known UK charismatic who, if you were in the British scene at the time, you would know this name. Uh, and they are still around, so I'm not going to mention the name because I don't think it's fair because hopefully their attitudes have changed. But I'll never forget being in a charismatic meeting where he stood at the front and he said, you'll notice that I don't have my Bible with me today. Uh, I'm not so legalistic as to think that I always have to have my Bible with me when I preach. And I mm -hmm. remember thinking, I feel like walking out. But yeah. actually, what was interesting was that the thing he said were all biblical, actually. When you, you know, when you knew the Bible yourself, but what he wasn't doing is he wasn't showing us the roots of, his, of what he was saying in the Bible. He had grown up in a biblical environment. He was trying to throw off legalism and, and all that. But anyway, the point I'm saying is that we were not really respected or accepted in many charismatic circles of the time in the UK because we still were clinging on to sort of well, I mean, I was going to say reformed thought, but maybe even just sort of biblical thought, you know, because mm -hmm. um, some of them became a little bit anti-Bible at some points. Um, but of course, yeah. in the reformed camp, uh, which I think is where you would sort of squarely place me now, um, I think in the early days, they wanted nothing to do with us. And, and so, you mm. know, um, which was quite an interesting thing. And of course, you know, to me, I'm like, why do we have to choose? Uh, right. And of course, you know, if you look at a specific issue like baptism in the Holy Spirit, Lloyd Jones, who was, you know, very highly respected in the evangelical world at the time, uh, he held to a position that you, you know, had a subsequent experience of the Holy Spirit. But John Spot, Stott, on the other hand, said, no, you don't. And if those two greats can't agree, you know, why, why do we have to sort of reject each other because we have different views on issues like that? So for us, you know, we tried to be reformed and charismatic. And what's interesting is we were that before that was trendy, I think. And um, of course, when Wayne Gruden comes on the scene and mm -hmm. issues his systematic theology, we were like, ha ha, finally, someone who thinks similarly <laughs> to us. So that was quite nice. When I um, heard Sam Storms speak in one of the interviews, I think that you had done, he made the comment that two of his best friends are John Piper on the one hand and Mike Bickle on the other. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting because, you know, those two guys are not part of the same planet, let alone country. Yeah. And yet here's a guy who can see Jesus Christ in both and embrace both. And, you know, I, I just think that we need more models like this. People who can, quote unquote, reach over the aisle and the aisle of their own camp or heritage yeah. and say, you know what, Jesus Christ is bigger than my camp or heritage. That's right. And, and who's, who are humble enough to learn from someone that they disagree with. Absolutely. Them. You know, to, to be able to say, look, that guy over there, you know, I disagree with him on this issue, but my goodness, he's ahead of me on this other issue. And so I need to learn from him. And I think there's a strength that comes in that, you know, that I mean, the Bible talks about God's manifold wisdom or multicolored or mul many right, faceted right. wisdom. Uh, and, and I just think, you know, I want it all. And so, you know, yeah. I mean, I think Toppy, my pastor, he jokes sometimes about us as a church that we live somewhere in between the spirit filled Bible and the, the ESV study Bible. You know, somewhere in the gulf in between those two is where we are. You know, we want to take from both camps uh, and receive what's good from both. And I, I, I think I see that in, in you. I see that in a lot of other people. Actually, I, I think I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic than you. I think there is a, a growing trend for people to actually at least listen to each other um, and to actually, you know, not, not jump to conclusions. And the internet really helps us for that because it can bring you right up and personal into someone's personal mind, really. Um, and that's what's so nice about blogging, tweeting, Facebooking, is that you see someone's innermost thoughts and, 
and when you see them like that, hopefully you, you, you see them as a friend rather than an enemy, you know? I agree. And, but I will disagree with one thing. I don't think I'm that pessimistic because I happen to believe that most of what you believe and teach is false, but that doesn't prevent me from having fellowship with you and being on a radio show with you. Really? That's a joke, <laughs> folks. You oh. ought to be laughing. Oh, I see. Okay, good, good. <laughs> see, he's from Britain. He doesn't really get the humor. This is how I roll. I play with people yeah. I like. Yeah, yeah, that's good. No, I mean, so there we go. But I think, you know, there is a feeling for some people of withdrawal from areas or that they don't agree with. And of course, I think people do that with the internet. Some people think, well, I'm not going to be on the internet. But one of the things I've been more passionate about recently, I'd love your take on this, is, is television. I think that, you know, especially with the whole thing about Strange Fire, and I'm not sure I really want to get too much into Strange Fire today. But one of the things that, that, that stuck with me there is, is Christian TV. And uh, a realization that for, I don't know, the last 20, 30 years, I've really kept well clear of Christian TV. I've been as, as remote and removed from it as um, many people are from the internet. Because, I mean, a lot of people don't, don't read blogs or the internet. Um, and I've been one of these people who've just sat there throwing stones at it, saying it's all a load of rubbish, you know. Um, and of course, there is a lot of rubbish on it, just as there's a lot of rubbish on the internet. Uh, but one of the things that I'm feeling is that, you know, perhaps as a generation, we've failed as evangelicals, if you like, uh, to colonize the, in the, the, not so much the, TV, the internet, but the TV. So I'm really thrilled that one or two people have been on uh, some of these shows recently. Um, you know, and, and I think good on them. I think, you know, the Apostle Paul didn't care who spoke before or after him at the Areopagus. So why should we? So, you know, Matt Chandler was on. <laughs> Ed Stetzer has been on, uh, James White and Michael Brown have been on recently. And I'm just beginning to discover maybe there's a lot more good stuff on Christian TV that I just didn't really realize was out there. Uh, I just found that often when I switched on the rare occasions I switched on, I used to want to throw something at my TV. So um, I don't know if you've got any comments on that, Frank, because I think, you know, if you think about books, um, you know, when the printing press came, you know, Christians really invaded that and, and, you know, solid evangelicals invaded that and the Reformation was the result, you know, with the internet, you know, I think Christians have invaded that by and large. I mean, I, I you know, there are some that are holding back, but I'm not so sure mm. about TV really. I mean, in terms of evangelicals, what, what's your thoughts on that? I plead ignorance on Christian TV. I just, I just You're don't like watch me, it. You're like <laughs> I, I don't even know who's on or what's on. But I do watch news programs, and I was delighted when our mutual friend Michael Brown was on CNN. Oh, yes. Yeah. That was very exciting to me to see him, you know, being interviewed by, I think it was Pierce Morgan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, by the way, I'm holding out for the day that Pierce Morgan will interview you. Uh, just to hear both your accents and the way you talk, <laughs> that would be a real delight to watch. But I, I enjoyed that and especially get a particular kick out of it because I know the man and to be able to cheer him on there and, and knowing that millions of people all over the world, not just in America and England, et cetera, are watching this. I guess when it comes to television, I want to see more of God's people who who have a message to share and are articulate and can give an eloquent presentation of the gospel and the perspective of the Lord on various issues to, to get in the limelight in those kinds of big venues, whether it's Fox News or CNN, et cetera. Good. I, in a sense, we're, you know, we're back where we started. And, and this is kind of like the introduction, really, because you, know, you could conclude that whole bit of us two waffling. Uh, for the last however long we've been waffling, by saying, you know, by all means, save some. Uh, and that should be our motive, really, when it comes to all of these media. That At the end of the day, right. in one sense, there's nothing new about blogging. There's nothing new about Twitter. Uh, you know, it's just a way of getting the message out. And whether it's, you know, scratching something down on, a, uh, on an ancient tablet, whether it's writing on papyrus. I mean, I can imagine when papyrus was invented, some people were like, oh, we can't put you know, <laughs> materials into papyrus, you know? And, and, and no doubt when the printing press was first invented, people were like, oh, we're definitely. using the tools of the devil, you know? Why would we do that? No, I mean, these are not tools of the devil. These are tools that can be used, as you said earlier, for good or for ill. So let's use them for good. And yes, let's use them well for good. So, you know, on that note, maybe with the time we've got left, we could just spend a little bit of time talking about how we use some of these tools that perhaps you and I are a little bit less mm. ignorant on. Because, uh, you know, we don't know much about telly. Uh, we don't know much about radio, although I think you've, you've been on radio as, as, as have I a couple of times. Um, but what we do sort of seem to spend our lives doing is a bit of tweeting and a bit of Facebooking and a bit of blogging. 
what about someone who's just listening to this, who's, who, who's suddenly thinking, you know what, I've missed it all this time. I, I should get out there. I, I do have a message and I want to share it. How should they hmm. go about it? I think anyone who has something to say, and, and I would say that every Christian has something to say, if nothing else, the gospel of Jesus Christ that made you a believer. I think that in the world today, you know, the new Roman road, Adrian, is the internet. It's the web. That's akin to what the Romans had in the Roman world and the first century Christians used to bring the gospel everywhere. It was the Roman road system. Well, the Roman road now is the web. And one of the major ways in which that road operates or how you get on it is a blog. And even for people who don't know how to write, I think every Christian should have a blog just to mark their space, Mm. just to get their name tied into a spot on the web so that no one else takes it, if nothing else. Yeah. For those who can write, a blog is a great way to get a message out. It's a great way to have interaction with other people, to get feedback, especially if you're someone who is a writer. For me, at least, I've been blogging since 2008 and really started taking it seriously in 2012. And even though I'm an author and I get book royalties and advances, so forth, I make my personal income from blogging. Mm -hmm. I've been able to build, you know, my audience large enough who are interested in what I have to say to where I can get advertisers on the blog and and I use affiliates and so forth. If anyone is interested in this, because I think it's a new world to many, many people, many Christians, especially, Mm -hmm. they can contact me through my blog, frankviola.com. There's a contact button and I can give them a lot of resources and information on how they can get started. I can teach you how to set up a blog in 10 minutes. I actually have a blog post on that. And just to start writing. Now, if someone really is serious about building traffic, building an audience, they have a message they want to spread virally, and they are interested in making money from their blogging talent, or writing talent, I should say. We actually have a seminar in the United States in Florida coming in July called the Buzz Seminar. And this is not a ministry. It's not a Christian event. It's for any writer of any type, whatever niche they're in. It's not exclusively to people of faith. Anybody who wants to blog, I know a lot of Christians will be at this event, but there's going to be unbelievers there too, which I'm excited about because I like to talk to those who don't know the Lord. But this is going to be a seminar that will teach you if you want to get into blogging or you're already a blogger and you want to take it to the next level and even monetize your blog through advertisements and affiliates, we teach you how to do this. And we also teach you, if you're an author, how you could publish a book, whether self-publish or land a publishing deal with a publisher and hit a bestseller list. And none of this is armchair philosophy, Adrian. I'm speaking with three other people. All of us are practitioners. All of us have actually done what we're teaching. But it's going to be in July. And if anyone's interested, they can go to thebuzzseminar.com. That's thebuzzseminar.com. This is not an inexpensive event, but it's an investment On the other side, and I want to say this too, I have written a lot about people who are getting into social media, whether they're using Facebook, Twitter, or even blogs from a Christian perspective to remind them that, you know, before you hit that publish button or that send button, the world now is going to see what you have said. Very good. And if they go to frankviola.com, they'll see that post we talked about earlier, 10 ways to be a jerk online. I wish every child of God would read that. Another one called warning, the world is watching how we Christians treat one another. There's another one called the most ignored sin, which went viral as soon as it went up. And then another one called don't believe everything you hear or read. I think if I have any contribution to the body of Christ, it's number one, to bring Jesus Christ back to his supremacy and centrality in the eyes of of God's people in the world and what that means. And secondly, how can we visibly treat one another the way we want to be treated, thus fleshing out Matthew 7, 12, which Jesus said fulfills all the law and all the prophets. We can think in our minds that we're good Christians and we're pleasing God and we're godly people, but if we don't have Matthew 7, 12 down, we have nothing. And Paul said that in so many words in 1 Corinthians 13. You can prophesy, you can have spiritual insight, you can raise the dead, you can heal the sick, but if you don't treat others the way you want to be treated, which is what love is, then you're just noise. (laughs) You're just smoke and vapors. You don't have the real thing. I agree. 
And I think what's beautiful about all of this is that, yeah, you know, someone can become potentially like yourself, someone who makes money and an income out of this, or they can just be someone who pops something online every now and then. And it's perfectly okay to be one or the other. It's a great Absolutely. outlet for someone who, you know, who feels they love to write, but they don't necessarily, you know, ever want to make it a career, but they just want to do that on the side. And, and to be honest, that was me when I first started. And I, I still have a career and I'm holding on to that career. I don't see myself being a full-time blogger like you, Frank, uh, but who knows? Um, but you are making money blogging. I just want the people to know that because you have a big enough audience. More than most people that have blogs. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but, um, the point is, uh, that's not why I do it. That's the point. Right. It really isn't. Exactly. I mean, I do it because I enjoy it and because of what I learn from it and because of a sense that I can help people. And I think that's exactly. the thing. Even if you're just helping three or four people, um, by putting a quote out that you've done, or one of the things I was saying recently is that, you know, um, maybe for, for pr preachers, you know, they, they're writing notes for themselves to use in the pulpit, um, and they're much longer than what they actually end up preaching. Why not share those posts? I mean, you could make a whole series of posts out of, out of your, your, you know, notes that lie behind your sermon. Uh, often a good sermon will be like an iceberg, and there'll be quotes, there'll be all sorts of things. So that's something that someone can do and, and be a blessing to someone else. And, you know, you, you, you and I both know that, you know, although it's often the big blog posts that lots of people come and visit, you know, there'll be, um, you know, hundreds of blog posts where just maybe two or three people, someone puts something obscure into Google and they come and they, they find your post. And yes. I sometimes get emails like that from people saying, oh, thank you so much. You know, and it was something I wrote three, four, five years ago, maybe um, that just for that person at that moment, it was kind of like a, well, to use language that we use, a prophetic word almost for that person, something that was so pithy and relevant to them. And, you know, I think, you know, I think it was Piper that said sentences change lives sometimes. And I think that's right. And if you're ever struggling about what to say, I once wrote a post called uh, 20 Types of Tweets. And perhaps we can link to that one as well uh, when we post yeah, this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that will just help you realize, actually, there's a lot more that you could say than you realize. Um, it's not all um, fancy theology. It can be, you know, very simple, basic stuff. But you know what? This has been so much fun. And our time has disappeared. I mean, can you believe it feels like we just started. I had so much more I wanted to say. I do, I do too. So maybe we can do this again, Frank. I, I think, you know, um, if, if, if our audience enjoyed this, they should let us know and we'll, we'll do this again. I'd love to do that. It'd be fun.